Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Soleri Report. This we continue discussing um, litigation related to COVID-19 by attorneys who've been bringing lawsuits and in this case had great success. We are speaking with Catherine Henry, an attorney in private practice in the state of Michigan and the founder of Restore Freedom, um, who has now argued and won before the Michigan Supreme Court. Catherine, congratulations. Uh, thank you, but I, I do need to clarify, uh, all of my work so far with the Michigan Supreme Court on these COVID-19 cases has been as an amicus attorney. So right. I'm not the lead attorney representing any of the plaintiffs involved. Right. Let's start with you. Your process by which you first became interested in what the governor had done, what was happening in Michigan and decided to really take time from a private practice, and I know you're a busy mother, um, to really do something about it. Yes, so um, I knew that e e um, the evening of uh, um, Thursday, March 12th at 11.15 p.m. when the governor came on and did her press conference and said that she was shutting down schools for three weeks, that it was just the beginning. It was just um, the beginning of something that was going to go far beyond school and far beyond just impacting um, children for a few weeks. It was going to be long lasting and it was going to have devastating effects all across the state. Um, so I, a lot of people just thought it was no big deal right from the beginning, but I did not, I was very upset. Um, so right from then I had a keen interest and was paying attention by the first week of April uh, first couple days of April, we got wind that the legislature was um, getting ready to vote to approve an extension for our state of emergency that had been declared by our governor. And I instinctively went into um, fight or flight mode. Uh, I don't typically do the, the flight version of that. So I um, took to the radio and took to Facebook and other avenues of uh, social media and um, was trying to educate uh, all of us around Michigan on what the law says, what the Constitution says, and uh, how to put the pressure on the legislature to not vote to have an extension. Unfortunately, that didn't work, and the legislature voted to give her another 23 days, uh, bringing her time to um, April 30th. Uh, I then participated in a rally on the Capitol steps that day and mm -hmm. was able to speak um, essentially in front of the world about how it was unconstitutional and quite frankly, the science and the medicine didn't follow what now, she was saying. Let me just interrupt you for a second. When you say unconstitutional, you mean both under the U.S. Constitution and the Michigan Constitution? Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Right. And so um, we were able to put the pressure on the legislature that day. Uh, and, you know, it's often referred to as uh, when the uh, armed men stormed the Capitol. That's not <laughs> at all what happened. Uh, I was there and um, it was actually with the state police. Uh, uh, other than the fact they unconstitutionally um, kept us out of the session of legislature in violate, direct violation of our state constitution. But aside from that, the, the uh, conversations with the uh, law enforcement that day were actually very pleasant and, and uh, kind. Uh, when I walked in, I saw they were taking temperatures and I felt that was a huge violation of my right to um, privacy. So I asked if uh, they would kindly allow me to proceed into the building without having my temperature checked or any of that stuff happening. And they said, yes, that would be fine. And I walked in and said, okay, thanks. Have a great day. That's, <laughs> that's the storming of the <laughs> Capitol that happened. Um, and so uh, at any rate, from then on, it was, um, it was on. I, I went home that night and I mean, we had thousands of people that were physically there. And then we had tens of thousands uh, more, if, if not more than that, that were watching live on all the Facebook live feeds. And I remember like we that. posted a lot of the videos that got posted on social media of what happened. And it looked like a wonderful group of people in a wonderful crowd. It was, um, especially the aftermath in the in the legislature um, while we were trying to get into the, the House chambers. Mm -hmm. uh, I stood right at the, the front of it all when I saw things might get ugly. It did not. But, you know, we had some guys, uh, guys in testosterone and tempers and things. <laughs> uh, it can lead to uh, some bad situations. I'm a, I'm a wife and I'm a mother of a, 
of a teenage boy. And uh, so I understand um, men a little bit. And um, <laughs> so I am also a trained mediator and I have been a mediator for um, over a decade. So uh, I, I wanted to be able to offer assistance and try to bring calm in that storm. And, and uh, even though uh, law enforcement in that situation was in the wrong, they didn't have the right, right. to do what they were doing. So right. um, I was able to actually be able to explain the, the bills that were being voted on and the executive orders that were being implicated. Mm -hmm. by those votes and uh, whether we wanted them to vote yes or no in general. I, I just wanted to at least give the information to the people. And it was amazing because there were inside, there were, we're in a hallway and there's uh, stairways. And so it's not like it was this big auditorium with a lot of room. We were packed in there like sardines. And um, it, it was phenomenal because we had a lot of people that were, um, you know, just again, no one knew who I was. No one knew necessarily that I was even an attorney before I started to speak. But uh, there were people that knew I had spoken outside and they were trying to quiet down this group of, I don't know how many were in there, three, 400 people uh, all in the, in the hallway there. And uh, when they knew that I was trying to help and try to offer information, it was amazing. You could hear a pin drop. Right. Every time that I um, had new information to offer, the crowd would quiet down and and long after the legislature that the house anyway left for the day um they they left and the people stayed and waited because they wanted information on the bill that had been passed senate bill 858 it was quite lengthy and um nobody was given any of it ahead of time because it had changed drastically from when they first got the bill to when they then modified it and sent mm -hmm. it back over to the senate um, and so it was amazing to have hundreds of people just sitting around continuing to wait to get the information that they were so hungry for. And right. that's what's continued to happen. So, you know, we uh, that day, one of the votes that did happen was that the legislature voted to um, approve a lawsuit against the governor for violating um, if she were to continue uh, with, mm -hmm. with the executive orders. And, and I posted on my page, uh, I'm not very much uh, social media savvy. I, I hate social media. I think it's evil. Um, I like real people. And, um, and so I did post on my Facebook page, though. Um, I think all I said, it was a sentence or two. It just said, you know, we're free. The governor's orders are over. You know, there's no more legal authority and there never was constitutional authority. So we're done. It's it. Right. Um, and I was flooded. I woke up the next morning within, you know, eight hours of having posted that. And I, from then on, I've had thousands of, of notifications coming in on Facebook and Twitter and all my other, you know, my email and my, my phone have been just blown up. And so it's been an interesting journey. Well, I can but, imagine, I just have to underscore this. If the legislature has refused to authorize, mm -hmm. why wouldn't you think it was game over? That is astonishing. I mean, if I were you, I would have been absolutely stunned when the governor went forward with more well, was it another executive order? I don't know the specifics of what she went forward with. So what she did was she said, well, the law says that I have to terminate it. So um, in one order, she terminated the executive order. The very next, uh, the, the state of emergency, excuse me, the next executive order, she uh, continued the state of emergency that was just terminated. <laughs> and then the next, the next order, she began the state of emergency that she had just continued that had just been terminated. Um, it's preposterous, the whole, like it doesn't even make common sense. It, the whole so thing is let, So let me just throw in another thing. The governor is a former prosecutor and a trained attorney. So she knows better. She took yeah. an oath of office related to the constitutions and with her experience and background, she knows those documents. So she, she knew what she was doing was not legal. Absolutely. She's taken at least three oaths of office that I'm aware of because she's a licensed attorney here in the state of Michigan and had to take an oath to uphold the U.S. and Michigan constitutions in order to be licensed. Right. She was a senator. And in that position, she took an oath of office, which, of course, is required under Article um, 11, Section 1 of our state constitution, but also Article 6 of the United States Constitution to uphold wow. the U.S. Right. and Michigan constitutions. And then she's our governor. So she took the same oath of office again to take that position. So it's something that for how many times she's taken the oath of office, she should certainly have figured out how to read those documents. Absolutely. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> okay, so so what happened next? Um, so yeah, we um, it's it's just been a crazy whirlwind of things. She ended up issuing um, last I saw. I don't know if she's tried to squeeze in anymore. Um, 192 executive orders in the year 2020. Wow. So it's yeah, it's absurd. Um, so in all all governors between 1993 and 2019, which includes her, um, all governors between that period of time, the total amount of executive orders issued was always much higher by Democrat governors, by the way. But if you look at all of them in that period of time, I believe that's 26 years. Um, I'm an attorney, not a mathematician, <laughs> but uh, that was 605 executive orders. And yet this year alone, she's issued 192. That's unbelievable. It's crazy. And in fact, of the 605, only 25 of them related to um, a state of emergency mm -hmm. in that 26 year period of time. So less than one a year where she issued 192. Now, I will say at my last count, um, of the 192 of those, 11 of those were based on things not related to COVID-19. They were, right. um, from what I can tell, they were actually constitutional because our state constitution, Article 3, Section 2, allows a governor to, uh, excuse me, Article 5, Section 2, allows a governor to issue executive orders for the purpose of reorganizing the executive branch so long as those orders are then presented to the legislature and they're given 60 days to essentially veto or disapprove of that reorganization. Right. Um, so I believe 11 of those were that, but I mean, so 181 out of 192, that's just, um, anyway, it's a lot. So sh go ahead. So the lawsuits then began. Yes. I believe the lawsuits actually began even before that lawsuits started, um, I believe in April both in federal and state court against her. And so you had, for, you had a, uh, some doctor's offices, whereas doctor's offices or hospitals brought litigation so, and then the legislature brought litigation. Yeah, so the, um, the, there are three doctor's offices and one patient that joined together as plaintiffs to sue the governor, uh, the attorney general, Dana Nessel, and the director of the Department of Health and Human Services for Michigan, Robert Gordon. And uh, that was done in federal district court. Um, and what the federal district court judge said was, um, well, if I don't have to issue this, if I don't have to um, make a decision based on federal constitutional principles or federal statutes, and I can just simply rely on it, resolving this case um, in terms of the state constitution or state um, statute, uh, issues, then I'm just going to do that instead, which they do that because they want to, you know, ensure a separation of powers and they're not unnecessarily trampling over things that are done right. by other branches of government. But quite right. frankly, if a governor is violating the U.S. Constitution, I don't care what other things are there. They should make it plainly clear to the, to the people of, of the United States, this governor, by doing this, is violating the U.S. Constitution. So she right. can't do that anymore and neither can any other governor. Right. But um, that's, you know, that's not part of the big government process here that we have these days. So um, essentially what they did is they had two questions that they want certified uh, to the Michigan State Supreme Court. So um, the two questions were very, very limited in scope, very specific. The first one was whether the governor's executive orders violated uh, after April 30th whether those orders um, violated this, either of our two statutes on point about emergency powers and uh, the 1945 and 1976 law, we lo uh, so lovingly call them here in Michigan, or um, whether either of those two statutes violated our state constitution, specifically the um, separation of powers and non-delegation clauses of our state constitution. So basically what part of this is she proceeded without authority from the legislature. And, and what this is saying is, you can't do that. You have to have authority from the legislature to do, to proceed. Now, does it also mean that even if she had uh, authority from the legislature, it would still be in violation of the Michigan Constitution? Or is it just simply lacking the, the legislative authority? 
Yeah, so the specific question, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was whether it wasn't so much just um, with regard to the legislature, it was, did she violate those state statutes? Now, right. um, what the court determined uh, on uh, October 2nd was that yes, she did violate the 1976 law after April 30th by continuing to issue the orders without the legislature's approval to extend uh, any further. Um, and so that's the very limited scope of that question. Right. Um, they didn't address, in fact, so the second question is whether those two constitutional, uh, excuse me, whether those two statutes um, violated our state constitution. Right. And they found that the older of the two, um, the 1945 law is entirely unconstitutional. No governor can ever use that again. Mm -hmm. um, and what they said though, is that they were not even going to answer the question about whether the 1976 law violated the state constitution because they had already determined that she had violated the 1976 law. And so essentially that made all of her orders illegal or unconstitutional on at least one basis. So they weren't gonna answer the questions any further. Again, I understand why they're trying to do that, but again, to me, um, it's it's really not forgivable. It's it's a dereliction of duty because when yeah, you they're, have, they're yeah. trying to narrow the scope to the least, uh, you know, they're they're trying to leave the door as closed as possible, and yeah. by narrowing the scope. Now, here here's what's interesting. So then you told everybody to burn their masks, and to my shock and amazement. I mean, it was pretty shocking what the governor said next and then what she did. So go ahead. Yeah, so she actually um, didn't skip a beat. While I was doing my uh, Facebook Live explanations to people about the executive orders uh, and YouTube Lives, she was actually going on and doing press conferences saying that, well, uh, the, the court said this, you know, that first of all, she... <laughs> First of all, she blamed the legislature for suing her in the first place, and she blamed the courts for making this determination that because of what the courts and the legislature have done, lots of people are going to die in Michigan. And uh, so then she said, the, the court said she did everything perfectly legal, she followed the laws, but that the 1945 law was unconstitutional, meaning the legislature back in 1945 had no right to try to give the governor the power in the first place. Well, a few things about that. Number one, the way the law was passed in 1945 is that we had a, a legislature who did violate our state constitution by passing that bill, but then we had a governor in 1945 that signed that very same bill to make right. it become law. Right. So if she wants to blame the legislature, she's got to take the hit herself. Right. Um, and so the, the other piece to that where she was saying that the court said she did everything perfectly legal, that's a bald-faced lie because what they said is she followed the wording of the 1945 unconstitutional law, but that she blatantly, a seven and zero opinion right. by the Michigan Supreme Court said she violated the 1976 law. Seven justices out of seven said she violated the law and right. she stood there in front of the Michigan people and said, Nope, I didn't violate any laws. They said so. Not only that, but if a law is, is unconstitutional, such as the 1945 law, she has the duty to not uphold the laws. She took an oath of office to uphold the U.S. and Michigan constitutions. So she needs to know better. She should know better. And she took an oath to know better. So she never should have been using a law that was unconstitutional from the beginning. So there's just a, a huge so variety of I, problems. I just have to tell you one story. I served as the Assistant Secretary of Housing in the Bush administration at HUD. And we had a regional administrator get in a bit of a squabble with the secretary. And the secretary was complaining about a decision he'd made. And he said, but Mr. Secretary, I had to. That was the law. And the secretary blew up and he said, the law, the law? I don't have to obey the law. I report to a higher moral authority. <laughs> And when your governor said what she said, I thought, uh-oh, you know, here we are with the higher moral authority thing here. Because yeah. it was that, you know, the hubris with which she conducted herself to me was very shocking. Well, so she also then, um, I started to say that she she told the people of Michigan that her orders had at least 21 days to be in effect, which is a, a lie. Right from the beginning, it was right. a lie. because. Right. The, um, the way our court rule, rules work is that uh, 
individual orders or judgments as between parties are often held in abeyance for that period of time because she would have that period of time to file um, a request or a motion for reconsideration or right. for rehearing. And, um, but if she does file a motion for reconsideration, that specifically says no, nothing is held in abeyance during that 21 period of time, right. the 21 days. Um, and so uh, the, the precedential effect, as they were calling it, right? So the case law uh, would be cemented uh, she said after that period of time, but nothing in this precedent ever indicated that. In fact, it was very clear, very clear that the only uh, cases on point, the only court rules on point very clearly said that the second you have something in this situation where a law right. is deemed unconstitutional as it applies and affects 10 million people, the moment that the court clerk files that and date stamps it and makes it available to people, that's when it comes into effect. So her orders, her executive orders were no more at that point. And again, she's a licensed attorney. She definitely should have known better. And if she didn't know better, then so, she shouldn't be a licensed attorney. So I would like to point out that all the small business owners whose businesses have been shut down or whose enterprises have been shut down. And when I watched all the videos of the Michigan uh, you know, all the all the citizens coming to the Capitol, you know, a lot of them look like small business owners and small, you know, people who generate their own income. I would like to point, while their businesses were shut down, she continued to get her salary. Yes. <laughs> yep. And right. uh, while, while she shut down people like hairdressers, she tried to claim that one of her teenage daughters was doing her, her hair, dyeing her hair for her. Yeah. Not happen, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so she did file a. I, I don't know if it's a motion to reconsider, consider, but she she did do another filing with the Supreme Court to try and. She filed a motion to ask the court to wait at least twenty eight days uh, before they put their decision into effect because she said she wanted to be able to utilize. Oh, this is this is wonderful language. Let me see if I have it right here in front of me. She wanted to be able to, um, oh, I don't have that, uh, nope, I don't have that particular one in front of me. She wanted to be able to utilize the other uh, administrative tools uh, of the executive branch, is what she was saying, so that she could take time to take all of her executive orders and put them into place under um, other kinds of orders through the executive branch, but not through executive orders. So she just wanted to be able to use different statutes to do the same thing. Right. And I thought, how ridiculous. They just said it violates the separation of powers for you to make these orders under this statute. And yet you're telling them you want to go do the same exact thing under a different statute. So of course, I, um, uh, the legislature filed uh, a response to that. The attorney general's office filed a response to that. Uh, the plaintiff, the original plaintiff in the case filed a response, and then I filed a response as well. Uh, my response was a little bit more um, jam-packed full of information because they opened the door to talking about these other alternative methods. And these alternative methods are not constitutional under the same concepts that the mm -hmm. original law was declared unconstitutional. But not only that, you have, um, you have, uh, quite frankly, our court actually talked about this concept, but the director of the Department of Health and Human Services, he comes into play here because all along they've been trying to, uh, he's been issuing, you know, he had issued, I think, three orders maybe throughout the summer where it was reiterating her orders and then um, adding on top of the misdemeanor penalties, he was adding um, civil infractions of up to $1,000 uh, as well as um, business licensing sanctions that were done in a summary fashion with no hearing oh my so, god you're kidding nope that's been happening to our businesses all along and so now um the orders that we have in place that she's put in place the very same day she filed that motion with the court which was was it two mondays i think it was two mondays ago now um she filed that at the same exact date that she had her director of the Department of Health and Human Services issue the next round of uh, emergency orders under the public health code to require people to wear masks and to have certain businesses shut down or at um, very reduced capacities um, to be able to stop people from gathering for any purpose, things like that. 
So this same director, um, in his press release, the day that he released, I want to say it was October 5th, he released the, um, this first round of new orders. And in so doing, he, again, is, is showing utter uh, contempt for the Michigan Supreme Court court and for the legislature and talking about how they're just partisan and they don't know what they're doing and they're killing people. And then he talks about his time working as a clerk, I believe, in um, the United States Supreme Court and how, you know, the non-delegation doctrine, as he called it, is something that hasn't been used ever in the state of Michigan to invalidate a state law. And he claims that it has not been used at all since in 85 years to invalidate a federal statute. And to that, I responded, and I quoted his whole statement to the Michigan Supreme Court, in case they happen to miss that one. And uh, I let them know the reason why that's so important is because uh, our state constitution, so the U.S. Constitution, we have a separation of powers, which the phrase separation of powers is nowhere in the, the United States Constitution. But what we see is that we have Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3 that separate out the executive, the, uh, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, respectively, with, with the powers that they have. So that's an obvious common sense separation of powers. Right. Then in our state constitution, we have Article 4, Section 1, Article 5, Section 1, and Article 6, Section 1 that do the same breakdown of powers. However, in addition to that, we have Article 3, Section 2, was actually, which was actually the main thrust of this, um, of a half of this uh, certified question case in front of the Michigan Supreme Court anyway. And so that is um, the Michigan Constitution, Article 3, Section 2, has only two sentences, and they're beautiful. Um, they say, uh, separation of powers of government. Those words are actually in our state constitution. The powers of government are divided into three branches, legislative, executive, and judicial. And then the second sentence here says, no person exercising powers of one branch shall exercise powers properly belonging to another branch, except as expressly provided in this constitution. So um, although I would argue that common sense and the very words that are in our United States Constitution preclude any kind of delegation of power there because right. it's separated for a reason, that phrase is not in the United States Constitution. So it is properly called a notion or a doctrine uh, in, in that sense. However, our state constitution, it is properly called a clause because it's actually words in our state constitution that prohibit such action right. outright. And so when he talked about that it's a notion, he said it's a doctrine and then he downgraded it to a notion that has never been used to invalidate a law in the state of Michigan. To that I say, uh, I'm disgusted at all of our judiciary to, to this point because there are clearly several <laughs> unconstitutional laws on the books because there's a, been a separation of powers issue there. Right. And these two are very specific ones that are um, at issue with that thing. Um, but that's not, it's not a doctrine. It's a clause you but have here, to follow Here's with. the thing. This is really simple. It's simple because the, the, the law requires the legislature to authorize. The legislature declined to authorize. The legislature is suing to say you can't do it without their authority, but you're just doing it. You know, it's kind of make up the laws you go. <laughs> well, so that's, that's the one element to it, right? That's the separation of powers kind of argument right. that, in fact, the legislature had their own lawsuit that had been started in May right. and uh, hadn't seen oral argument, and it will never see oral argument. In fact, I don't know if you've been made aware of this, but we had um, two orders come out from the Michigan Court of Appeal, excuse me, the Michigan Supreme Court on the 12th of October. Right. Um, and so one was the response to the governor's request for the additional time, and they, um, they took it up very quickly, so they granted the request to hear the issue uh, quickly uh, under immediate consideration, but they said that uh, this was only a two-sentence order. On the order of this court, the motion for immediate consideration is granted. The motion for, to stay the precedential effect of the October 2nd opinion is considered and is denied. Now, what was the, the vote on that, the denial? Um, this one is um, uh, a six and one. Wow. So strong. 
Not Excel unanimous, one. but very strong. Yeah. yeah. Very strong. And so uh, the, um, and the, the interesting thing is the one justice on here, Justice Bernstein, that went against that. Nowhere in here does he talk about that the Constitution allows for that to happen or that there's any kind of actual authority that's given to the governor or even the court to allow that to happen. In fact, the only thing he talks about are some practical implications he's worried about with unemployment benefits. Well, quite frankly, regardless of whether something is, is deemed wise or not, or whether uh, it seems like it's the prudent thing to do or not, or whether there's a different or better way to handle it, uh, our constitution is the supreme law of the land, and if you don't like it, that's too bad. Your job as a Supreme Court justice is not to rewrite the constitution, right. nor as exactly. a governor. Right. So, so one of the points you made in, in your different discussions of the process as it's been going along, you provided some really frightening details of some of the things the Michigan state government was doing underneath these orders, like no FOIAs, no open meetings. Now, you know, that may sound like details, but when you realize what could be going on underneath the carpet while, you know, while they're free to operate in secrecy, it's pretty frightening. Um, yes, it is. Um, and some of those things have actually uh, continued to happen with uh, reductions in the um, um, the Open Meetings Act and the Freedom of, of Information Act. So, uh, again, these are all things that I knew were problems, right? I mean, before this even happened. And I've been trying to warn people publicly in mass quantities since at least April. In fact, when in May, when I came out with the Restore Freedom Initiative constitutional amendment petition to amend the Michigan Constitution, it's not to change any kind of substance or form of the government. It's to try to address some of these very unconstitutional laws that are already on the books and that have remained on the books despite all these other provisions uh, being in our constitution. So um, to have that uh, way to reel back in Right. those powers. And so people understand this is a government of the people, by the people, for the people, that in order to have true government accessibility and accountability, you, you have to be able to have open meetings. Uh, and a governor can't just change that with a stroke of a pen. Uh, you have to be able to have um, freedom of information, to have that flow of information. The constitutional amendment actually uh, goes a step further, and it requires governments to operate their their websites to provide all kinds of information for the people in the state of Michigan without even having to make a request. Because quite frankly, we right. shouldn't have to request the kind of information that's out there and allow them to have five, 10, 15 days to make all these uh, denials and, and play these games. So uh, there's a lot more concerning things that are happening with regard to- what, one, of the, one of the reasons that that really rang a bell for me is what I saw in the federal government, in the federal credit programs, is when you could declare an emergency or a disaster, many of the financial controls would be lifted and the money would start to fly in very dangerously political ways. And if you had secrecy protecting it, then it would quickly go out of control. Yes. And so, you know, the invitation for shenanigans, particularly in a highly politicized environment in the campaign year, is frightening. Yes. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of different implications all the way around in that regard. So right. um, just looking now at- Now tell me. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Keep uh, going. Well, I, was, I was just going to say that um, we're seeing, so for example, we have our Michigan Director uh, of the Department of Health and Human Services who um, debuted uh, more uh, prominently on October 5th with these additional orders, and he's continuing to issue more and more orders supposedly under the public health code here in Michigan. But the interesting thing is that the public health code that he's using, that particular statute 333.2253 is, is not very long. Right. And, and yet it seems that none of our government officials have read it because it allows the, the director of the Department of Health and Human Services to do three things. One is to enforce health laws that are already on the books. Let's pick the mask issue, for example. There's no law on the books that says we have to wear masks, so that doesn't apply. Um, he can do uh, issue orders to ensure continuation of essential public health services, 
well, a service is something that you're offering for the benefit of somebody else that they can right. choose to decline. Right. And so if they want to offer masks for people to use, if they want to offer hand sanitizer, if they want to offer educational opportunities to hear about COVID-19 and ways to boost your immune system or whatever, uh, those would be allowed. But to require things of us is not acceptable. And quite frankly, it's to ensure the continuation of essential public health services. So instead, what did our governor do um, so far is that she had shut down things so that we did not have programs like AA. You were allowed to have alcohol, the, the liquor stores were allowed to stay open, but you were not allowed to go to an AA meeting. You right. were allowed to go get pot, but you were not allowed to go to an NA meeting. Right. You were allowed to um, you know, have an abortion, but you were not allowed to have a hip replacement. And then right. uh, you weren't allowed to receive any kind of spiritual guidance or support or counseling services to deal with the ramifications of any of that. So um, essential public health services should entail anger management and counseling services and all those mental health components, especially even the World Health Organization recognizes that when entire economies are essentially shut down, the instances of domestic violence, of self-harm, of child abuse and neglect skyrocket. Right. And, uh, and a lot of them are not going to even be reported because people like mandated reporters are kept away from the very people that they're there to try to protect by the mandated reporting laws. So um, those essential services are precluded. So the only other thing, the third thing that is allowed by the statute that he's using is to prohibit the gathering of people for any purpose. So <laughs> technically he can you know, stop people from being in restaurants or reduce the amount of people that are in stores or restaurants or things like that, but um, can't require masks from that at right. all or any of those other provisions. But then let's just look at the common sense element, prohibit the gathering of people for any purpose. I'm pretty sure that Article 1, Section 3 and Article 1, Section 4 of our state constitution expressly say no, not a thing. Uh, the same as our First Amendment to the United States Constitution that expressly guarantees us the right to peaceably assemble, to petition our government for a redress of grievances, to be able to um, exercise our religion freely. Um, so right. those things are guaranteed to us in both constitutions. And the state statute uh, obviously violates that, at least in that sense. So um, it's very interesting that all these orders that he's trying to do and the mask requirements and, and requirements for schools and all these other things had absolutely nothing to do with what the law on the books actually says. So. Right. So where now that the, they've ruled on the 12th, where does it go from here? Well, so an interesting thing is that <clears throat> I said a moment ago that the Supreme Court on the 12th had two orders. The other order that they had was that the, uh, given the results that came out of the, the other lawsuit that the legislature and I both got to participate as amicus, um, the legislature in their own lawsuit had filed a motion for immediate consideration of a peremptory reversal, saying that, you know, the lower courts got it so wrong. They said that the, um, the governor could continue doing what she's doing, that the laws were constitutional, that she was following the laws, no big deal. And so um, what the court said in this, and this was, um, I believe, a, yes, this was a four to three decision mm -hmm. uh, of the court, but um, they said that the, the motion for peremptory reversal is considered on an immediate basis. Um, and then they referred to their, the reasons stated in the other case with the doctor's offices, and that due to those um, that motion is granted. And that means that they then, in fact, reversed the part of the judgment of the Court of Appeals, holding that the governor possesses the authority to issue executive orders under the EPGA, that 1945 law. And as stated in that um, doctor's case, the Emergency Powers of Governor Act of 1945 is incompatible with the constitution of our state and therefore executive orders issued under that act are of no continuing legal effect. So this order is effective upon entry, it said. So we don't have any more of the 21-day uh, garbage that she tries to pull, uh, saying her orders are still allowed. And um, that uh, they're remanding the case to the trial level court for immediate entry of an order uh, granting uh, declaratory relief. Uh, the interesting thing, just as a side note, so 
someone who also watches my videos and um, is trying to, you know, keep up to date on all the law and the Constitution and trying to inform herself, uh, she decided to write an email to the uh, House Democratic uh, leader, Christine Gregg. Mm -hmm. And uh, so she wrote her an email, and yesterday, on the 19th of October, the um, uh, House Democratic le leader wrote back and said that the uh, governor's executive orders are still in effect, and it's only when what? the... Yes, she said when the... Uh, uh, order or the opinion from the court of, uh, from the Michigan Supreme Court goes into effect, that's when we'll lose all these protections for unemployment and COVID restrictions and things like that. Now, keep in mind, that's on the 19th of October, whereas on the 12th, in um, two cases, they smacked down the governor's orders. And in this, they specifically said, this order is effective upon entry. So this was a whole week prior so right. her sending that uh, email out to a constituent lying her butt off about the executive orders. So, so this is why I think it's so important of the many things you're doing, which are important. One of the things that is so important is helping people who are not attorneys or not familiar with government process, what these different things mean and what the law says. Because with that information, they can be very powerful, but they need to know, you know, because it gets very complicated and very technical quickly. But if they have someone like you making it clear and explaining, they can be very, very powerful. I mean, I can't imagine, is there a reason why a business or a church in Michigan shouldn't be open for business? Well, I could tell you that a church in Michigan should never have been closed ever. I absolutely agree. Right. We have a First Amendment right under our United States Constitution, and we have an Article One, Section 4 right under our Michigan Constitution. Um, in fact, I just want to share this with you because I believe in many ways our Michigan Constitution is much more specifically crafted to protect our rights than the United right. States Constitution. Um, so our Michigan Constitution says, Article One, by the way, our, this is our preamble to the state, uh, the state Constitution of Michigan. We, the people of the state of Michigan, grateful to Almighty God, for the blessings of freedom and earnestly desiring to secure these blessings undiminished to ourselves and our posterity do ordain and establish this constitution. So all of the rights below, they're saying undiminished guys, not that they can trample upon them or change them or infringe upon them in any way. Specifically, article one of our state constitution is the declaration of rights. It's fabulous, 27 sections specifically devoted to our rights. Um, section four, is called freedom of worship and religious belief. And it says that every person shall be at liberty to worship God according to the dictates of his own conscience. So if you want to worship God by having uh, common fellowship with your neighbor, uh, in the general sense of the term, you can do that. If you want to go to a Sunday service and not wear a mask and sit in the same pews that you've always sat in next to the same people you've always sat next to, you can do that. Even if your church is a church that holds 500 or 1,000 people, you are welcome to do that. Um, <clears throat> no governor, no Michigan Department of Health and Human Services director, no legislature has the right, no state Supreme Court or even the United States Supreme right. Court has right to trample upon that right so no church should have ever closed in right. terms of I agree with uh, you. on a legal basis on a christian basis we're not given a spirit of fear uh, i believe it's second timothy one through seven maybe mm -hmm. um uh, tells us uh that we're not given a spirit of fear but a power of love and of a sound mind so we're supposed to use that sound mind to not live in fear but live in faith and be able to understand uh, where we need to do things and where we don't. And God always wants us to be able to worship him. So at any rate, as far as that question goes, um, nothing should ever stand in the way of a pastor uh, or a congregation having service. I have but to tell you, there was one wonderful group. I forget what state it was, but the congregation decided it would have worship service in a, in a parking lot or in the park. And the police came and tried to shut them down and say it was illegal. And they said, no, we're having a worship protest. And the police said, oh, okay, then it's okay. <laughs> oh, my so they goodness. Just, right, so they decided to call it a worship protest. Oh, goodness. Okay, so, um, so two more questions. Um, 
have you, I'm, I'm sure you've been very busy, but have you had time to look at what other states are doing and how they can benefit from understanding what's happening in Michigan? I haven't had time, <clears throat> excuse me, to look at what other states are doing, but what I can tell people is that the United States Constitution, Article 6, has a supremacy clause, and it says the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land right. for every single state and territory here in the United States. So no matter who your governor is, or what your legislature is doing, or which president gets elected in November, uh, that provision remains, and the United States Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and it's not what uh, the, the Constitution as it's defined by the Michigan, or, or excuse me, by the United States Supreme Court over the last couple hundred years. It's what the law actually says in terms of what, how, what are the words actually written in the United States Constitution, and what did they mean back then, because that's the meaning that uh, it means now. Also in the sixth, uh, Article 6 of our sta uh, United States Constitution is that oath of office. So every single state, uh, it doesn't matter if you're in Louisiana or California or New York or Washington or you know, any Oregon, any of these other places where we're having a lot of big issues and receiving national attention, every single executive, legislative, and judicial branch officer under Article 6 of our United States Constitution is required to take an oath to uphold the US Constitution. So if their state constitution ever should um, transect the United States Constitution, that state constitution uh, doesn't hold up. It doesn't, um, you can't take away any mm -hmm. liberties guaranteed to us in our United States Constitution by somehow having a state constitution that somehow takes them away. Um, I, used so to be, I used to be part of a group in Philadelphia that would take the US Constitution and get a neighborhood to read it together and talk about what it meant about your responsibilities and obligations within your community. And yeah. it, was, you know, it was like a constitutional covenant discussion for your neighborhood. And it was really remarkable because it's an amazing document. And you know, if I think listening to you, one of the things that really inspired me that you did was, uh, a, a radio commentator said, if you could talk to Governor Whit Whitmer, what would you say? And you proceeded to talk about the oath of office she has taken and how it's real. And, you know, we we're, are in a society now where we have a group of people who think, oh, that's just the, you know, the yeah, 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 you say when you're getting your job or something, you know, but it's, it's not real. They don't understand it's. And so for the law to work, and I would say, the entire economy to work and the civilization to work, it's gotta be real. It's gotta be, the law is a living, breathing thing. And you know, when you describe that, you really infuse the fact that she made a, a commitment and that's a legal commitment to, and it's a covenant, it's a spiritual covenant and it's real. Yeah. Right. And, and so she's gonna get held accountable, but you know, we all have a responsibility to understand that and be part of it. And if we will, if we will support it, we can, you know, it's a very, very powerful thing. I, yeah. I think the, co the covenant, the spiritual covenant we have as a people with, with that constitution is very, very real. And it's the power we need now. Now, well, I have to say to get that power, we need people like you explaining it to us. <laughs> Well, and so with in that with that in mind, um, the um, the Ninth Amendment of, of the United States Constitution is the same as the first uh, Article One, Section Twenty Three of our State Constitution, and mm -hmm. um, uh, I don't think I've gone over that yet here in this interview, have I? No. I okay. I just did, came off of another interview, <laughs> so I want to make sure I wasn't uh, mixing them up, but. That's one of the most important. So we know that the 10th Amendment um, of the United States Constitution says that uh, for any of the powers um, not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, um, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or right. to the people. Right. And that's very important. But even more important than that, the people need to remember and to realize and, and memorize uh, the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration in this constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. 
So that goes back to God gave us all of these liberties. And the whole point of government is so that we can come together to live collectively as a society and have a system or a mechanism by which we can ensure that um, people are not going to infringe upon the rights of other people. So you can't go and murder someone and then not be held accountable for that. There will be a government, a system in place to hold you accountable for doing so. And so the whole point is of this, uh, the Ninth Amendment to the United States Constitution is underscoring the point that it is government that is limited by the Constitution. Government is limited by the Constitution and is expressly given only certain points of authority where they're allowed to act. If the Constitution does not give the government a point of authority to act in a certain way, that means they're acting unconstitutionally. They're right. acting outside of the bounds of their given authority. Right. And so that means the flip side of that is the people, the people are not given their rights by the, the government, by the governor, by the president, by the legislature, by the courts. The people are given their rights by God and the people's rights, the whole point of the constitution is to secure those blessings of freedom. And so the whole, the government and the whole makeup and framework for the government, state, federal, local, it doesn't matter. It's all there to, um, to protect those individual liberties. And right. so when the government goes astray with that, uh, then again, the government has done wrong, not the people. And so the people, when they have all these God-given liberties that are protected, um, this, this catch-all provision says, we don't need to list all of our freedoms because this document is not meant to box us in and uh, you know, carve out certain exceptions for us to be able to exercise liberty. The whole point is that no, 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 no. We're limiting what the government can do. Right. And we're specifically identifying the obvious areas where people need to uh, need to have special attention drawn to uh, the rights that we have and that government cannot trample upon, but that we have all of the other rights still intact. And it's the government's job not only to not trample upon them, but to serve to protect them right. as the whole point of society in the first place. Right. So people need to remember that. Do you have a right to wear, uh, you know, not to wear a mask when you're in public? Yes, you do. Does right. it, do we have to write inside of this document that we have the right to breathe fresh air? No, because <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And we right. don't even have to wait for, you know, hundreds of years of jurisprudence to come out from the United States Supreme Court to tell us, well, these unenumerated rights are this one and then this one and then this one. That's great if they want to talk about those by way of example, but that is no exhaustive list. If we were setting it up to have our state Supreme Court or United States Supreme Court or any other government branch or office create and write down this list for us, then we just would have done it ourselves in the Constitution. We specifically said there's this list that remains unlisted and we have those rights and government don't screw it up because you can't trample upon right. those. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, so how, how do we keep up with your work? How do we support you? We know you founded Restore Freedom. Tell us, tell us how we can help. Uh, if anybody's in Michigan, I'm going to ask that you help us collect signatures. We need to get 425,059 signatures in short order here. About four weeks time, we're asking for those signatures to be turned in. Um, so that we can get on the November 2022 ballot and, and uh, create history here. Because what we're trying to do is to strip away, we're not changing the form and structure of government with this petition. We are stripping away all the garbage that's been added and clarifying all the, the points of, um, quite frankly, the obvious points that our government hasn't been able to let sink into their thick skulls in all these processes. And so, so this stuff never happens again. And once we do it here in Michigan, that'll certainly pave the way for it to begin happening and movements of, of grassroots people can start doing this in their states as well. So we need the help with that. If you're not here or you're, you know, you're just not physically able to help us collect signatures, again, you don't have to be somebody that's at an event with thousands of people. You could be that person that throws a few empty petitions in the back seat on a clipboard. You, you get out of the car, you're looking at the uh, filling up your tank at the gas station, look over and the guy next to you is not wearing a right. mask. Right. That's going to be your clue that he might enjoy his freedom and fresh air and he might be willing to sign that petition. So we need everyone to step forward with this. Obviously donations help. 
uh, as of today, my team's trying to figure out what the very little amount of funding that we do have. Uh, are we going to be able to advertise on the radio these last few weeks? Are we going to be able to do some Facebook or Google ads? You know, what are we able to do to help get the message right. out there? Um, and so the funding, but also um, there's the legal, uh, the legal side of the work, right? Uh, all the briefs that I've been filing, there's always a court filing fee. Um, some of the courts, it's $150 each motion. Some of them, it's 75. Right. There's always, you know, the cost of if I have to get printed uh, documents, like from the court of claims, that stuff is not available online. So if a case happens against the legislature or, excuse me, against the governor uh, in the court of claims, and I want to try to participate in some way, I have to ask for paper copies of all the documents and pay right. for that. Right. Uh, and so that's usually a few hundred dollars. Uh, I'm going to need a new printer here com uh, completely in, in a little bit. I've already had multiple toners and drums and things. Right. Uh, so it, the amount of costs in that sense are astronomical. And I am not taking on any new cases right now because I'm fighting for the people as a whole and in defense of our United States and Michigan Constitution. So um, my, my family is living off of donations basically right now. So we. So have if, you, if you come into Solari, we've started something. You'll see a, uh, on the homepage, you'll see a, a man in a business suit with red gloves. It's called the Take Action Crowdfund. And it's there to support litigators who are fighting these fights. So we will send you a donation from the crowdfund but we will also put it up on the crowdfund so we can direct people to your website. Awesome. So, yes, thank um, you. and I'm hoping that when we publish this, this will also help. And so, our website is uh, restorefreedomkh.com. That's restorefreedom, K as in Catherine, H as in Henry.com. Okay, kh.com. Okay, yeah. great. And our donation, we have a donation button that's on there. We also have ways to get involved for people that are quite frankly all across the world. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Okay, well, Catherine Henry, thank you for everything you've done, everything you're doing, everything I know you will do. It makes, a, it makes an enormous difference. So um, I hope your kids know how proud they should be of you. Uh, the teenagers don't, but I'm, I think the six-year-old <laughs> does. <laughs> okay, you have a wonderful day. Thank you again. Yes, thank you.